Hello and welcome to today's devotion. We have been in Luke chapter 22, the very powerful chapter in this gospel. And it focuses on the time of Jesus' ministry where he shares the last meal with his disciples, the Passover meal. He talks about um, bestowing upon them a kingdom. He has an interaction with Peter, and um, which is in every, every gospel, the denial that uh, Peter will, will give to a, a young girl, actually regarding knowing Jesus and what that means in terms of his calling. And today we take a look at verse 35 through 38. Same context. He's still um, in the same period where he is um, going to be betrayed into uh, the hands of the Jewish leadership, be, be betrayed by one of his own disciples, one of his closest friends, Judas Iscariot. And so all this is taking place uh, before that, right before that, hours before that. So as we go into today's devotion, I invite you to pray with me and we'll get into it. Thank you, Father, for your grace and for your kindness, for your goodness and for your faithfulness. And as we go into your word through your Holy Spirit, we pray that you open up our hearts and minds that we may not only be able to hear your word and understand it, but also hear it with obedient hearts that we may, in obedience, trust you with all of who we are, pursue you with all of who we are, desire you with all of who we are. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 35. He also said to them, he meaning Jesus, them meaning the disciples, he also said to them, when I sent you out without money bag, traveling bag or sandals, did you lack anything? Not a thing, they said. Then he said to them, but now whoever has a money bag should take it and also a traveling bag. And whoever doesn't have a sword should sell his robe and buy one. For I tell you what is written must be fulfilled in me. And then he quotes the scripture, and he was counted among the lawless. Yes, what is written about me is coming to its fulfillment. Lord, they said, look, here are two swords. That is enough, he told them. He went out and made his way, as usual, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. When he reached the place, he told them, pray that you may not fall into temptation then he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, knelt down, and began to pray. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. Being in anguish, he prayed more fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he got up from prayer and came to the disciples, he found them sleeping, exhausted from their grief. Why are you sleeping? He asked them. Get up and pray so that you won't fall into temptation. This is the scene where <clears throat> the forces of evil and the forces of God come together and clash directly in this world. It has been leading to this for some time. In fact, since Jesus' birth, the forces that in Genesis 3 brought this world into a state of perpetual death and violence and cruelty and inhumanity, those forces are coming against Jesus and in this world facing each other for the final battle. This is it. Jesus has called together 12 different men from different walks of life 
Some of them knew each other. Some of them hated each other. Whether it was Matthew, the tax collector, and Judas Iscariot, the thief who was put in charge of the money bag. This group of men now are with Jesus as this final conflict is taking place. And even though Jesus told them how the final conflict would play out, their ability to comprehend and to really accept it was such that they couldn't. We say things like, I just can't believe it. When things come into our lives that are so great, that are so um, incredibly unbelievable, we just use the phrase, I can't believe it, even though it's happening to us. And so he says to them in verse 35, he reminds them of when he sent them out two by two to advance the kingdom in the same way that he was advancing the kingdom, that they would go into a village and pro proclaim the word, which is what he did. And as testimony to the authority of that proclamation, they were to heal the sick. They were to bring recovery to those who were ill. They were to give sight to the blind. They were to do miracles in his name, giving validation that their proclamation was true. And as such, people were not only healed from the sick, they were set free from demon possession, set free from bondage to the evil one. And he reminds them of that. When I sent you out, did you lack anything? Not a thing, they said. Then he said to them, but now whoever has a money bag should take it and also a traveling bag. And whoever doesn't have a sword should sell his robe and buy one. Now, what's happening here? He's saying this because the reality is he is going to be taken from them and they will no longer have him with them to give them protection, to give them firsthand instruction as to what to do, when to do it, how to do it. They will feel and they will be literally on their own outside of the protection of the father. And so he tells them now, whoever has a money bag should take it. In other words, you're going to need these resources. God will be here, but you will need these resources. And if you have these resources, you will be able to have some sense that you are being taken care of. Not that they can't trust in God, but this is something in which they are going to feel as if they are completely alone and that God has abandoned them. And in this case and in this case alone, having these things will give them some sense of security in the midst of feeling that, as if they've not only lost everything, but are in danger of losing their very lives. Do they need, when he takes a look at it, a money bag? Do they need a travel bag? Not really, not if God is protecting them, but to have that gives them something physical to hold on to while they trust in God. Something. It's, a, it's, it's, it's mercy, really. Because without that, they would feel even more lost, even more at a loss, and more fearful. And so this is a mercy instruction. Hold on to that. Not that the Father is incapable of protecting them without it, but for their sake, because they're human, it gives them some sense, some sense of comfort, of security. And then he says, because what is now happening, he quotes the Old Testament, he was counted among the lawless. Jesus will be branded an, a criminal. 
And then concludes it by saying, yes, what is written about me is coming to its fulfillment. Look, they said, here are two swords. That's enough. It's, this is not sizing up anything. It's simply saying, you're not going on the offensive. When I sent you out, you were going on the offensive. You were going into villages. You were proclaiming. You were tearing down strongholds. You were healing the sick. You were casting out demons. You were going on the offensive. Now, the evil one is on the offensive, and you're going to have to go on the defensive. And these things that I tell you will give you some sense of some physical assurance, even though you might not need it, even though you don't need it because the Father will be watching over you. For your sake, I'm giving you this so that you can have some sense of physical, earthly, not necessarily comfort, but protection and confidence. And when he's done with saying that, when you take a look at verse 39, he goes out and makes his way, as usual, to the Mount of Olives. This was a place where Jesus was very familiar and would spend time there. The Mount of Olives is outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was not a friendly place for Jesus. From day one, the way he went to the temple and, and started turning the tables over, the people that ran the city were watching out for him and wanted to get rid of him. So he would stay outside the city at the Mount of Olives. It still happens, not, not today, but for many years beyond that, when pilgrimage, pilgrims would go to visit Jerusalem, they'd stay at the Mount of Olives. They'd bring tents and they would stay outside. It's, it's not harsh weather. Passover is a spring. You can do that. It's not harsh weather at all. And so this was a place that he was known to have stayed while he visited Jerusalem. And he would oftentimes have his disciples with him there. So this is, this is familiar turf, if you will. And when he reached the place, this is verse 40, he told them, pray that you may not fall into temptation. Now, what is the temptation? When we think of temptation, we think of doing something wrong, stealing, lying, cheating, things of that nature. The temptation is to lose faith. Remember, when we think of faith in our culture, we think of doctrines of what we adhere to, we agree with, and that's part of it. But faith with Jesus, there's no doctrine yet. He hasn't died. He hasn't risen from the dead yet. It was faithfulness, an oath to him, having trust in him and pledging one's loyalty to him. The temptation then will be to fall back from that. To fall back from fulfilling your oath. To fall back from fall or to fall back from standing on your pledge. That's the temptation. And he says, pray that you may not fall into it. Because when you're exhausted, I mean exhausted, we see that they were exhausted because they fell asleep. When you're exhausted, it's hard to trust in God. It's easy to be discouraged when you're tired. It's easy to be not only discouraged, but to throw in the towel when you're tired. And this is the temptation that Jesus is talking about. Pray that you may not fall into it because you don't have the resources not to fall into it. So stick close with God. And then in verse 41, he withdrew about a stone's throw and he began to pray. It's a, it's a powerful learning um, scripture for all of us because all of us will get tired. All of us will run into times in which we know that God is faithful, but don't have the wherewithal or the resources for us to trust him. And it's that time in which we draw close to him, lean into him and pray that while we don't have the resources within us, the character within us to be faithful, to trust him, that he who began a good work in us, he is faithful. 
and that even though we're going through this, he will restore us and actually use our times in which we are at our weakest to make us stronger. Well, thank you so much for tuning in today. Next time we uh, will continue with this uh, chapter. Until then, may the faithfulness of God be with you and may you find peace and comfort and strength in his faithfulness. I'll see you next time.